Okay, we're in the forward, forward, forward. And this is the last thing that I recorded, apart from the credits. So, let's go. Forward. The chapters of this book were delivered as one or more lectures to a variety of groups. These include the Christian Schools of Ohio Conferences, Pensacola Christian College Summer Session, 18 Lectures, Via Vera School in North Hollywood, California, the Alabama Christian Schools Conventions, the Southern Association of Christian Schools, Christian Edu- Christian Edu- the Southern Association of Christian Schools, Christian Educators Association of the Southeast Conventions, Fairfax Christian School, Trinity Christian School of Mesa, Arizona and the Michigan Association of Christian Schools and the Church and School of Christian Liberty, Brookfield, Wisconsin. The contents were written over a period of 15 years and sometimes expanded as Christian school teachers and administrative... The contents were written over a period of 15 years and sometimes expanded as Christian school teachers and administrators by the hundreds discussed at the, by, the, by the hundreds sorry didn't get it the contents were written over a period of 15 years and sometimes expanded as christian school teachers and administrators by the hundreds discussed by the hun- oh bother The contents were written over a period of 15 years and sometimes expanded as Christian school teachers and administrators by the hundreds discussed these matters with me. The contents were written over a period of 15 years and sometimes expanded as Christian school teachers and administrators by the hundreds discussed these matters with me in question and answer sessions. The work was also submitted to the Valley Christian University, a graduate school in Clovis, California, as a part of their doctoral program and requirements. I am deeply grateful to the many, many dedicated Christian school teachers and administrators who are the pioneers in the key area for Christian future. Administrators who are the pioneers in the key area for our Christian future. I believe that their work is of unequalled importance in our history. I believe that the Christian schools will triumph and will educate all America in terms of God's word and requirements. I believe that we shall see a steady stepping up of the teaching so that, in due time, the content will be increased and the time span of education shortened. I believe that, in due time, the Christian school will teach more than is now taught in kindergarten through high school in seven or at most nine grades, so that students will enter college, universities and vocational schools in their very early teens and enter the world of work by the time they are 20. The Christian school movement is the quiet revolution of our time and the great and enduring one. I am grateful that I have had my small part in that revolution. Bruce's John Rushdini, Calcedon, Vallecito, California, 95251. Je sans frontier. Je sans frontier. All right, well, that was a foreword. And we'll come back and do the credits. Okay, we're in part one, uh, chapter one. And, uh, yeah, let's get after it. Part 1. Chapter 1. Religion, Culture and Curriculum. The dictionary definition of education describes it as, quote, the impartation or acquisition of knowledge, skill or discipline of character, end quote, 
The function of education is thus to school persons in the ultimate values of a culture. This is inescapably a religious task. Education has always been a religious function of society and closely linked to its religion. When a state takes over the responsibilities for education from the church or from Christian parents, the state has not thereby disowned all religions, but simply disestablished Christianity in favour of its own status religion, usually a form of humanism. An excellent means of analysing the religion of any culture is to study its concept of education. To see education as an expression of religion is not an approach limited to Orthodox Christians. Liberals, anthropologists and status educators have so viewed it. According to a Columbia Teachers College publication, which denies... Which defines... Uh, let uh, try, um, still coming in a bit rich. Let's, uh, an excellent means of analyzing the religion of any culture is to study its concept of education. To see education as an expression of religion is not an approach limited to Orthodox Christians. Liberals, anthropologists and status educators have so viewed it. According to a Columbus, Columbia. According to a Columbia Teachers College publication which defines religion after Tillich as, quote, ultimate concern, end quote, religion is the framework of education. Quote, religion as ultimate concern, therefore, provides the large framework within which education occurs. It determines perspective and basic orientation. It governs emphasis and fixes trends. Religious concern, whether or not recognised and designated as such, is the motive which actuates the educator and produces the general pattern of its work. The relationship between education and religion as ultimate concern is, in fact, a reciprocal one. Not only does religion provide the ultimate foundation for education, but education provides an admirable field for implementing religious commitments. This is Nathan. Thanks for joining me in the booth. I really hope you're enjoying the live streams and videos. To find out more about this narration project, or to make a donation, go to nathanteacher.com. Thanks. making faith explicit in concrete act. A significant test of the governing religious convictions of a person or group is the character of the education promoted by that person or group. End quote. Not only does education find its foundation in religion, but the educational curriculum expresses the religious standards and expectations of a culture. The Latin word curriculum, from which the English word is taken without change of spelling, means a running, a racecourse, chariot, and is cognate with the Latin verb carere, to run. A curriculum is thus the chariot, racecourse, or vehicle whereby a culture expresses its religious faith and standards. The basic curriculum is called the liberal arts curriculum, quote-unquote liberal, from the Latin liber, free, and it is a course in the arts of freedom, or a vehicle in 
the arts of liberty. A liberal arts curriculum is thus a practical answer to the question, what is liberty and how does a man prepare himself to be a free man? The modern liberal arts curriculum is the long development of a humanistic religious answer to this question. Hellenic in origin, it gives us a man-centred and essentially anti-Christian answer to the question, how shall a man be free? This question is basically the same as the one asked within the sphere of religion, how shall a man be saved? The liberal arts curriculum is thus the channel of liberty and of salvation. It is the means whereby a culture saves its children from the encroaching evils and threats and prepares them for life in terms of the knowledge, skill or discipline of character required to be a free man. And this is, inescapably, a religious task. The origin of the modern curriculum is in Greek humanism. And it should be noted that Greek culture was humanistic, but not individualistic. Werner Jaeger has noted that, quote, The intellectual principle of the Greeks is not individualism, but quote-unquote humanism, to use the word in its original and classical sense. It meant the process of educating man into his true form, the real and genuine human nature, end quote. Baura has also cited this humanistic orientation. Quote, because they believed in their own human nature and liked to see it harmoniously at work, the Greeks developed a morality which was founded on human nature and able to operate freely and confidently without worrying too much what the gods thought about it. End quote. Let's try that last bit. It's just a little bit flip, a little bit glib. without worrying too much what the gods thought about it. End quote. Greek educational... Just take it down a notch again. Greek educational... That's a bit wretched. Greek education reflected this humanistic faith Poetry had a place of importance comparable to the Bible, except that no written work had any binding power. Homer, however, had a religious significance in that he wrote of heroes, the real gods of Greece. The dance and the gymnasium were important, not for physical exercise, but for religious reasons. Enthusiastic dancing had as its goal being God-possessed and God-filled, incarnating the divinity which was potentially realisable by all men. Physical development had not mere health as its goal, but the realisation of the idea of man, a divine humanity, the perfection of form. The goal of man was to be an incarnation of the idea, the universal, and hence the study of geometry, of abstract forms, was more religious no, no, no. And hence the study of geometry, of abstract forms, was more religious than practical, or more accurately, was practical because it was religious. The importance of geometry in the modern curriculum and its priority over many studies which much more. All right. over many studies much more relevant to the world around us, is an evidence of the continuing hold of the Greek curriculum on us. The modern physical education class is, in terms of its professed purpose, an anomaly. Ostensibly, the school wants to give the child an opportunity for physical exercise. It therefore provides bus transportation to and from school and prevents children from exercising themselves by walking a mile or two. 
The purpose of physical education classes is not exercise, but planned recreation, group activity, and very definitely in many cases, games and dances deemed psychologically advantageous to quote-unquote liberal education. Greek education was also geared to the polis, the city-state. Man for Aristotle was a political animal, and hence man was to be educated into the saving life of the state. Plato's Republic was a plan for total education, for total statism. The status purpose of humanistic education was even more clearly emphasised by the Romans. According to Grimal, quote, Roman morality has a very distinct aim the subordination of the individual to the city, end quote. Religion and piety had reference to the city, for the gods were the gods of the city, and religion, by binding men to the gods, bound them to the city of the gods. According to Barrow, quote, For a, quote-unquote, religious man, the phrase is usually, quote, a man of the highest pietas, end quote, and... Piety is and pietas. And pietas is part of that subordination of which we have spoken. You are pious to the gods if you admit their claims. You are pious to your parents and elders and children and friends and country and benefactors and all that excites or should excite your regard and perhaps your affection, if you admit their claims on you and discharge your duty accordingly, the claims exist because the relationships are sacred. End quote. The liberal arts curriculum thus had a statist orientation. Man's liberty, man's salvation was to be found in faithful subordination of himself and all his being, to the city of man. The chief end of man, a political and social animal, was to glorify this state and to serve and enjoy it all the days of his life. It is not surprising, therefore, that Christianity came into rapid conflict with Rome and the entire world. It was a battle between Christ and Caesar, between the city of God and the city of man, for the control of the world and of history. On the one hand, the emphasis was on the tri- Let's try that again. I'm just too happy about that. It is not surprising, therefore, that Christianity came into rapid conflict with Rome and the entire world. It was a battle between Christ and Caesar, between the city of God and the city of man for the control of the world and of history. On the one hand, the emphasis was on the triune God and... I'll be here with that. On the one hand, the emphasis was on the triune God and on his eternal decree on the primacy of eternity, and on the other hand, the emphasis was on the primacy of time, on the civil order as the order of incarnation and divinity, and on the temporal decree of the total state. A Christian order did emerge in measure, and education began to turn increasingly to the Bible for its norms. But the prevalence of Platonistic and Neoplatonistic strains as evidenced in such conservatives as Hugh of St. Victor, and the rise of Aristotelianism steadily undermined the theocentric emphasis. It's a weird way to pronounce. Steadily undermined the theocentric emphasis. Gradually, the basic Greco-Roman humanism gained ascendancy and the city of man became united to the city of God in name, and the Church of Rome became this true state. True education and piety involved submission to Rome. Education had, as an addition to it, celibacy as a requirement. 
total dedication to this very present city, the Church of Rome. Bishop. 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 Bishop Otto of Freisburg, Freis, Freising. I'm going to pause the video and look up that. Okie okay, dokie. There we go. Bishop, Bishop Otto of Freis, Freising. Freising. Bishop Otto of Freising sorrowfully noted that, quote, I seem to myself to have composed a history not of two cities, but virtually of one only, which I call the Church, end quote. The true polis, or city of man, was now the Church, the voice and champion of the reviving humanism. The very deeply rooted Christian nature of what is called medieval Europe must not be understood, must not be... must not be underrated or overlooked, but the Greco-Roman humanism steadily regained ground and conquered the intellectuals of Christendom and triumphed in education. The curriculum was simply an adaptation of ancient humanism. The Renaissance accentuated this rebellion against Christianity and was a logical development of the long tradition of man-centred educational theory. Instead, however, of emphasising the church as the true polis or state, the Renaissance emphasised the amoral power state and individual, anarchistic man. God and law had dropped out of the picture, and both man and the state faced the world uninhibited by the restrictions of Christian faith and morality. According to White, in the Renaissance, in the states, this meant tyranny, and in the personal realm, anarchy. Quote, the prince rules according to the motto, first my will, then the right. Tell S. de l'Enotre. Sorry, I didn't realise it was. That was Latin. Tell l'Enotre, bon plaisir. The action of the social nihilist stands under the aegis. Break the chains which hamper your personal liberty. In both, an energetic, activistic component is manifest. End quote. This coincidence of anarchism and tyranny is not accidental. Both are the products of nihilism, relativism and pragmatism. When God is man's universal... Man is dependent upon God as the focus of his life and the source of his law, standard, status and salvation. Man can then be independent of man because he is dependent upon God. He acts and performs his calling with reference to the eyes of God primarily rather than the eyes of man. The humanist, however, has only man as his audience. In every man-centred faith, quote, the individual needs society as a resonance box, end quote. For humanism, man is his own law and his own lawmaker, so that social approval is the best test of law. This standard leads inevitably to the socialization of life, law and living, because man must move in terms of man as his God and law. Instead of declaring God to be the universal, Man becomes the universal and the source of meaning and being. Quote, the medieval saint was virtuous in the desert also. The invisible eyes of God hovered above him. Universal man needs society in order to... Sp Calm down. Universal man needs society in order to... Sp Universal man needs society in order to display his virtues. 
his realm is only of this world. End quote. Thus, wherever education becomes humanistic, it will produce both statism and anarchistic individualism. Man's only law will become himself and other men. Moreover, a curriculum which professes to be Christian because it includes religious instruction, but it is... but is... but is in all else humanistic in orientation, will also breed statism and anarchism. The centre of the stage becomes man without law, that is, without God's law, and the amoral state, an amoral anarchistic man then predominates. The Reformation emphasised the sovereignty of God and the total scope of his law, that is, predestination. Humanism was thus in principle denied. The function of education and of the curriculum was the preparation of man to glorify God, to enjoy him and to serve him in and through a chosen calling. So that was quite... And to serve him in and through a chosen calling. In the United States, the Christian school developed to a degree unknown in Europe where the humanistic past and the Enlightenment hindered the development of a Christian curriculum. Until Horace Mann, all American education was Christian. The educational accomplishments of America were without equal in the world, as noted in a report in 1800 by a Frenchman, Dupont de Nemours, National Education in the United States of America. The result practically was a high literacy rate with illiterate with illiter with illiter with illiteracy with illiteracy illiteracy with illiteracy almost non existent, and only four in a thousand being unable to write legibly and neatly, according to this report, with excellent abilities in the basic skills manifested by virtually all. The religious instruction was also excellent. In 1815, the average age of criminals in the United States was 45. In 1960, 19. Because men were taught to be dependent upon God, they were independent of man and the state. Their source of security, their source of security, Their source of security was neither the anarchistic individual nor the amoral state, but the sovereign and triune God. The Enlightenment came as a counter-movement to the Reformation and a revival of the ancient Greco-Roman humanism. Its philosophical premise was the dialectic of nature and liberty. Nature was introduced as a substitute concept for God, a natural law, which meant whatever the philosophers chose to call it, took the place of the hand took the place of the hard and fast written word of God. After Darwin, nature became an invalid concept. Quote unquote nature is blindly evolving and is without mind or reason. If there is to be law, then it must be man's law, so that statism succeeded the older liberalism of natural law as the new source of authority and law. But law is, in this new sense, anti-law. That is, a denial that there is any absolute law in the universe, any truth beyond pragmatic truth. As a result, the whole curriculum becomes progressive, that is, instrumental. No subject embodies any truth. All ideas are tools for man's use in self-realization. Liberty, therefore, means freedom from law as absolute, law as embodying truth and moral order. If truth be denied, then equally equality.
If truth be denied, then equality is possible because all ideas are equally valid and equally false. Their status is Their status is in utility, instrumentality, and nothing more. For the curriculum, this means, quote, teaching and... I lost focus there. Literally, literally, focus. For the curriculum, this means, quote, teaching children, not subject matter, end quote, and teaching children means teaching them this total relativism so that no truth exists except man. A man realises himself in and through the great society of Dewey and others, the total state. Thus, for Dewey, Orthodox Christianity, with its belief in truth and error, good and evil, heaven and hell, the saved and the lost, is anti-democratic and irregular anti-democratic and irreconcilable and irreconcilable with a democratic society. Biblical Christianity thus has no place in a curriculum and therefore in the life of the great society. But according to Conant, the family is an aristocratic institution also and one that ensures that, quote, inequality of opportunity is automatically and often unconsciously a basic principle of the nation. End quote. To hold democracy in equal to hold democracy. To hold democracy and equality and maintain a family based society is to create is to create is to create, quote, a perpetual compromise, end quote. Thus, the family has no place in... Okay. Thus, the family... Thus, the family has no place in the curriculum in any Christian sense and is rapidly being crowded out in life. The basic premise of the state school's curriculum is humanism, relativistic humanism. The liberal arts, the arts of freedom, involve the abandonment of God, truth and law for the affirmation of man. This is an unconditional affirmation, all things. This is... This is... This is an unconditional affirmation. All things are relative to man and have a pragmatic truth in relationship to him. A Christian curriculum must be developed, therefore. The centrality of biblical instruction is basic to the liberal arts of Christian education, but the rest of their curriculum must be revised in terms of Christian liberty, the arts of Christian freedom and dominion under God, the study of law is therefore necessary. We live in a world governed by law, and yet our modern curriculum still reflects the great curriculum's disinterest. The Greek. And yet our modern curriculum still reflects the Greek curriculum's disinterest in law. The Roman approach treated law as a product of the state and the highest law was the health or welfare of the people. True law was thus relative to man, pragmatic, and hence subordinate to the state. Thus, any reference to law and obedience to law was a branch of political studies, of civics, or of government, because the state was above the law. In the modern curriculum, neither in grade, high school, nor college, is a general course in law taught except for business law courses and references and references and references to law and civics and government courses but for the christian law is not under the state or a product of the state 
but an expression of God's holiness and order. The state is subordinate to law, and the meaning of law must be central. And a man is not truly educated in our modern world if he is ignorant of the nature and meaning of law. Many states require a course in the U.S. Constitution. The Christian school should also require a course in the nature and meaning of law. Another area of importance, one of the major problems confronting man in his, is his... Okay, let's rule. Another area of importance, one of the major problems confronting man, is his relationship to this... Inv- is his relationship to his environment, the world he is born into and the world he reacts to and in part remakes. Ecology, though very often fallacious from a Christian perspective, is thus a very important area of study. Man cannot usurp the role of God in his relationship to the world, but neither can he treat himself as a creature of his environment since he is created in God's image. The study of ecology is thus of major importance to the Christian liberal arts. The approach to history in a Christian curriculum is of necessity radically different. From the perspective of humanism, the the determination... Yeah, nuts. The determination of history is from within time. The determination of history is from The determination of history is from within time and potentially at least by man. From the biblical perspective, time and history are alike determined from all eternity by the triune God. Thus, the philosophy of history varies. The subject matter does also. The term, quote, Middle Ages, end quote, is revelatory of the bias of modern historiography. It views real history, significant history, as ancient Greco-Roman humanism, followed by the, quote, darkness, end quote, of the Christian era, and then of a Christian era. Of a Christian era, and then finally reborn with the Renaissance. The, quote, Middle Ages, end quote, were thus a kind of historical recess, lapse or blank spot. The, quote, Dark Ages, end quote, were not dark, but alive with new impetus and a new inventiveness. The, quote, Middle Ages, end quote, cannot be read in terms of the post-Trentine church, nor in terms of the centrality of the papacy. Economics deserves... Sorry, I heard the phone go on. Economics deserves a place in the high school curriculum, not as a branch of civics or civil government, but as an independent law sphere. Literature needs a re-evaluation of its position. The modern thesis of Shelley that poets are the uncrowned legislators of the world rests on the ancient and pagan concept of the inspired bard who incarnates who incarnates in, incarnates in, uh, incarnates incarnates in himself who incarnates in himself the divinity of being Instead of a humanistic perspective, a Christian perspective must prevail. 
the neglect of such literary gems as the sonnets of David Gray and the poems of Folk Greville need to be remedied. Psychology has, in the modern curriculum, taken the place of theology as the guide to life. Anthropology also increasingly speaks with authority concerning man's life. But anthropology, the doctrine of man, and psychology, the doctrine of the soul, were once aspects of theology and in a Christian curriculum and in a and in a Christian curriculum a curriculum curriculum and in a Christian curriculum and in a Christian curriculum must be restored to theology In approaching the sciences, it must be denied that such a thing as science exists. No workable definition of, quote, science, end quote, is possible. If it be defined as a body of organized knowledge, the term can be applied to virtually every field. If it be defined as... If... If it be defined as experimentally verifiable knowledge, then astronomy is excluded, as well as geology and other studies. Just as there exists no religion in general, but many particular religions, so no science in general can be defined, but only particular sciences. Moreover, in approaching any particular science in any body of scientific thought, we must deny that we are confronted merely with a body of facts. The facts are set in the context of interpretations, and interpretations rest on pre-theoretical religious presuppositions, as Cornelius van Til and Hermann Duyvert had pointed out. To accept the universe as ultimate and self-created is a great act of faith, but it is a non-Christian faith. To assume the ultimacy of chance as against the ultimacy of God and his eternal decree is equally an act of faith. Both the Christian and the humanist begin with an act of faith, but the humanist strives to persuade the Christian that this difference between them is one of faith versus knowledge, when it is a clash of faiths in which we must hold that truth and knowledge are with Christian faith. A great evil introduced into Christianity, pietism, led to a surrender of knowledge and the world to the unbeliever and a withdrawal of the Christian to a purely inner world of experience. As a result, relevance to the world and to knowledge came to mean secularism and the church moved from a theocentric orientation to a man-centred and experiential emphasis. The result was a surrender of the world. The results was a surrender of the world and of education to humanism. Only by reclaiming the entire curriculum as the curriculum of Christian liberty, as the Christian liberal arts course, can education be again a liberating force and man be delivered from the devastating and enslaving forces of amoral statism and anarchistic innovation. and anarchistic individualism. A Christian curriculum is thus a major and urgent necessity. A state curriculum, to be true to itself, must teach statism. A Christian curriculum, to be true to itself, must be in every respect Christian. Okay, that was a bit of a marathon, but um, here we are. Well done, everybody. Big slap in the back. Okay, hope to see you in chapter two. Well done for listening right to the end. If you would like to know more about this important Christian audiobook project, please go to nathanteacher.com. Thanks.